All right. Well, joining us on the line today is somebody who I'm so excited to be speaking with. He is the director of the XFL documentary, the 30 for 30 special. This was the XFL. And I can't be any more excited to welcome in Charlie Ebersol. Thank you so much for joining the two-man power trip of wrestling. Oh, man, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks. Uh, there, there's, absolutely, there's so much that I want to cover, both about the XFL and both about your, I like to say, your wrestling lineage, because obviously your father, Dick Ebersol, is the man behind Saturday Night's Main Event with Vince McMahon, and your mom, a part of WrestleMania too, which I hope a lot of people don't overlook that, but wrestling is in your blood. But this is the XFL, and I, the first thing's first. What led to the XFL documentary, and what was the XFL supposed to be? First of all, thank you for saying all that. And my mom will be thrilled to hear that you did not overlook her because I have to tell you, every time I've been interviewed and they ask about Saturday night's main event, I have to rewind and say, yeah, but let's not forget that my mother was there at the beginning. Um, Yeah. (laughs) No, this documentary, ESPN and I had been talking for years about how to do a documentary uh, about uh, my dad or, you know, something around sports, given, you know, what I'd grown up around with my father running NBC Sports for so long. And when they came to me and said, what about the XFL? I jumped at it because for two reasons. One, I desperately wanted to make a film about my father and Vince McMahon's relationship because I knew no one else could or would. Um, and two, the XFL is really the only time I really ever saw my dad and Vince, for that matter, really fail. And I thought that they were so incredible in the face of sort of all the adversity that got built up around the XFL and then also in how their relationship survived what was a very public um, failure uh, were, was great fodder for a film. And I really, really, really wanted to show a different side of Vince. I was, I'm exhausted fighting people who have sort of the wrong impression about him. And I thought a film would be a great opportunity to at least bring it to life. And and I think a lot of people, if they weren't around or they weren't fans or they weren't aware of what was going on in 2000 and 2001 with the XFL, it was definitely very groundbreaking. And it really was something that I think a lot of people had high hopes for. And obviously the advertisers were there. The broadcast partners were there. It was just the concept that needed to be kind of put on paper. It was great in the minds of those who created it, but it was the execution of the concept that I think needed to be kind of uh, maybe worked out a little bit more. But you're saying your father and Vince McMahon, obviously, like we said, Saturday night's main event, obviously changed professional wrestling in the 1980s. But now moving into football, which is more of your dad's world, over Vince McMahon's world, i got to be honest with you, and this is something I would love to hear your take, was Vince McMahon a football fan? Because I can't even see the guy stopping for five minutes to watch a halftime show, let alone a full game. I know. I've always wondered when it is that he had time to watch football. Vince is a huge football fan. I mean, before he created the XFL, he tried to buy the, U, uh, the CFL, the Canadian Football League. He, he, was a, he has always been – I remember him being a big football fan when I was really young. Um, cause when my, when my dad and Vince formed the, uh, Saturday night's main event, I was four and I grew up around there. I, you'll appreciate this maybe more than anyone else who's interviewed me. Um, when I grew up, Hulk Hogan was my childhood babysitter because I'm uh, once a month because I would go to the Saturday night main event. <laughs> and he'd be the last one to go out and wrestle. So I'd be in his dressing room for most of the night. Um, it was, uh, you know, to your point about how Saturday night main event, um, changed professional wrestling. The XFL did the same. I mean, th- th- there's actually a really clean parallel, which I try to draw in the film as well, between the two projects. Because with, with Saturday Night's Main Event, when my dad came in, Vince really said to him, what can we do to the television broadcast that's going to really change us? And my dad brought, you know, all the camera angles and all the stuff that's sort of now part and parcel and raw, and certainly what WCW stole when it came along was largely my father's production techniques, which then when Vince formed the XFL and my dad and him did the deal uh, for NBC to to broadcast it, my father did the same thing all over again with his team, which is, you know, they said, look, this is an opportunity to create a league for the television fan, which Vince felt was really important to the XFL. And so he gave NBC incredible leeway. And in, in, in doing so they created the sky cam, um, which now is in every football game and a lot of basketball games, the, the, um, 
Chetty Kim's on the field, miking the players, interviewing coaches during game access. All of those things were invented for the XFL. And so I say a lot in talking to people about the XFL, Vince is the greatest promoter and one of the greatest marketers of his generation, or really any generation. My dad is arguably one of, if not the most influential and successful sports producers of all time. So they understood broadcast through my dad and they understood live event and promotion through Vince and NBC had the most powerful marketing arm in all of television at the time. So they had all that locked up. What they didn't have is they didn't have a football expert. The people they brought in who ran operations for the XFL were guys who had worked at the NFL who wanted to work at the NFL again. And so they were not going to buy into Vince's bigger image, uh, excuse me, bigger vision of what the league could be. And so you know, the idea of no fair catch was about the only thing that made it through. And even that had all kinds of restrictions on it. And so when the game actually got played and the audience saw what, what they'd been marketed uh, was not, in fact, what was happening on the field, you know, you get that first rating that first night, which was insane. It was the biggest rating in 15 years on a Saturday night, um, which, you know, the biggest rating, frankly, since Saturday night's main event on a Saturday night. And then, you know, the second rating falls off a cliff. It's because that football product, to your point, was conceptualized very well, but not executed well at all. It's crazy because the energy in that pregame and in that introduction in the first game is off the charts. And I actually have the first game on tape somewhere buried because I'm a huge Opie and Anthony fan. And I heard your interview with Opie and we'll get to that later, but (laughs) I'm a huge Opie and Anthony fan. So I recorded the pregame show and had the first show and still do somewhere on a VHS tape. So I remember the energy specifically you had Vince come out, you know, with his smash mouth ball and the XFL leather jacket. And then you have the rock come out and cut a rock promo in front of a football crowd. And in Las Vegas, kind of questionable, what are you going to do? But you felt the energy in the crowd you felt the excitement and then when you had the opening kickoff or chase or whatever they wanted to call it to to kind of grab the ball they almost like the kill the man with the ball uh you know style of uh kickoff um you kind of <laughs> felt as the game went on it started to you know kind of lose a little bit of steam but i look at the television broadcast side of it as being a tv guy i look at the television broadcast side that says look you have wwe slash f level production nbc level production and then the affiliates and partners that were a part of it key factors in the xfl's image is that how it was portrayed to the television audience and do you think that that's something that kind of lost and got lost in translation was the television audience versus who you're playing for in front of you know 15 20 000 people yeah there's no question because they sold a million tickets to the first season of the xfl five of the eight stadiums were sold out for the whole season so this was not like uh this was not like the league was, you know, wildly, uh, w- excuse me, was a failure to the people going to the games. I mean, the Memphis Maniacs fans were the Memphis Maniacs fans from day one. The challenge was the television audience. And here's the thing. The, the, look, the football operations weren't great. They did not, they did not give the teams, first, the teams only had 28 days to practice. So right out of the gate, they sort of screwed the teams um, in their ability to uh, – they screwed the teams in their ability to get them up to speed to play on professional tele- – uh, on, on uh, broadcast television. But the second thing is they made a critical error, which is they only had two preseason games, and they used those preseason games to determine what their first game would be. And so the first game that got played was originally meant to be the game between the Orlando Rage and the Chicago – uh, enforcers and at the last minute about two weeks before kickoff of the season they decided to uh, switch to the Vegas game because in a scrimmage the New York team had looked really good well as it turned out the New York team was absolute crap and they got <laughs> demolished on national television and only had like 34 yards of total offense in the first half so it was you know not only was the game the play not great but they decided to go with a crappy game as opposed to the Orlando game, which it turned out was like 33 to 29 and was a remarkably good game. 
it, it's crazy. And that's, you know, of course, one of the things that will fall into the, the failure column. But I, I kind of don't like sometimes the parody that's used in the XFL because it was such a, a creative vision. And I know Vince McMahon would go on to kind of make light of it uh, with Craig Kilborn, you know, a few years afterwards, which is hilarious mm-hmm. if anybody mm-hmm. can go find it. But if you look at the personnel from the television perspective and you have the reuniting not only of your father and Vince, but you also have Jesse the Body coming back on board. You had Brian Bosworth. Bob Golick, Jerry Lawler was involved, good old JR, and Craig DeGeorge, an old WWF announcer, involved. How much of that played into what the brand of the XFL or what the, uh, the kind of stylized look of the XFL was all about, those guys specifically with their Entirely. personalities? Entirely, because if you go back and look at Saturday night's main event and then you look at the XFL, so much of it is there. The only difference is, and this was something that I don't think my father really was fully in aware of when he stepped back in the ring with Vince is this is smack dab in the middle of attitude era. Right. So, so all of that stuff that my father was used to the, like, you know, pray and eat your vitamins that obviously had given way to, you know, degeneration X and the rock and, and triple H, et cetera. And so I think there was an edge to the XFL that, that the WWE, excuse me, WWF, of the eighties didn't really have, you know, the iron Sheik was not telling people to suck it. Um, and so I think that that, I think that that added an element that was sort of unexpected. Um, so that when they went quote more WWE mid season to try to get viewers, that really was a much more, um, it was a much more adolescent, you know, version than the sort of red, white, and blue version of the, the WWE in the 80s. I, the, the one thing that you said, which I, I uh, totally agree with, is it annoys the hell out of me that people take such a hard edge and such a, a sort of laughable edge about the XFL. I think parody in some ways is the right word, although I think that might be giving the critics a little bit more uh, due okay. credit than they deserve. The XFL was a moonshot that was off by a couple of degrees. Like it wasn't, people think of the XFL as this massive failure because it only lasted one year. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that it got a lot closer than anyone really wants to admit, particularly the NFL and the people who are proponents of the USFL. I mean, you're, the opening night audience was 54 million people. I mean, they did a 10 rating. That is a ludicrously, on its best day, the USFL didn't do that. In fact, the NBA finals don't do ratings like that, let alone, you know, a, a startup football league. They beat the, that year. The rating of the XFL beat the World Series rating for that first night. So this was not something that just came out and like nobody, nobody would be talking about this thing if it hadn't gotten so close. And that's sort of the genius of Vince McMahon is how close he comes when he goes big or he wins. I mean, he, there's no in between. There's never, Vince doesn't do anything where it like lands in the middle. 